Welcome back, everybody, to another exciting episode of Cast to the Past, the time-traveling podcast, where we take a look at old video games in a new light to see if they're still worth playing or if they're just big piles of garbage. My name is Josh. And I'm Tom. And we are, as always, unofficially sponsored by Sparkling Ice Plus Caffeine. I'm rocking a blue raspberry this morning. Josh, what about you? I'm rocking blue raspberry Kool-Aid. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, as the kids would say. You are. And today we're drinking the Kool-Aid of our fans. We are covering the champion of March Madness 2022. Josh, what's the game? Ladies and gentlemen, we are here. We are gathered here today to talk about Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Now, Josh, are you okay? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Are I'm you okay good. with this choice? I, I mean, yes. I mean, there was better options out there, but I can understand. Like, we, it's Zelda. It's Majora's Mask. It's, it's a game worth talking about. There's a lot of stuff to, to cover about this game, which is good. But I feel like some games in our list got the, kind of the poopy end of the stick. Let go over, go over which ones you thought were underdogs or deserve better, just for listeners who maybe didn't check out the Persona tournament. Persona 4 Golden. How dare, how dare everybody. <laughs> Taking that out so, so early. Silent Hill 2. Mm -hmm. Still getting taken out. Earthbound uh, went pretty far, though. That I was, yeah. I was, I actually thought that could have won, but yeah, that's the second time Earthbound's been in one of our tournaments and has not, and has like almost won. Yeah, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Well, you were a little upset when this was announced. We'll just be honest. But I, I promised you, and I do mean this, I'm going to say this on mic. There will be no Zelda games in, in at least a, a couple future March Madness tournaments because it's two years in a row that we've had a Zelda game, an N64 <laughs> Zelda game win. So. Yeah, I mean, good thing is there's no more N64 Zelda games to talk about after this. True, 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 true. But thank you to everyone who voted, and let's get into the game that you picked. Josh, would you like me to do some some nitty gritty? Of yeah, Zelda? yeah. Let's do let's do some nitty gritty, and then we can just go in and get into our nitty gritty. So, The Legend of Zelda: Majora's Mask was released on April twenty seventh, two thousand, in Japan, and then a, a sizable gap later in North America on October twenty sixth, two thousand. It was developed by Nintendo EAD, published by Nintendo, directed by Eiji Anuma and Yoshiaki Koizumi, two Nintendo legends whose involvement in this game we will get into. It was later re-released on the GameCube as part of the Legend of Zelda collection in 2003. You had to trade in your Nintendo points from games you bought to get that. And it's been ported and re-released on several Nintendo Virtual Consoles since then. Josh, what was your history with this game before today's episode? I tried playing this a very, very long time ago, and I didn't like it at first. Uh, it was very wow. confusing to me. Now, as a kid, I mean, what, 2000, two, uh, 2000, I was 11, 12 years old-ish, like, I was good at video games, but when it came to like puzzle solving and thinking, I was more of a hack and slash type person. I want to shoot everything and kill everything and thinking in video games. That's ridiculous. I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. I want that mind numbing, just action packed fun going into this. I, I didn't really, I was like, I know it's the sequel to Ocarina of Time and I know it's different i know it's weird and it really wasn't until the internet started to pick up with like youtube and whatnot when people started making videos and talking about majora's mask a lot more and they were talking about is it better than ocarina of time is it the best zelda game it's so different but it's like different in a good way and all this kind of stuff and just like listening and reading and stuff like that i'm like you know what i'm gonna go back in and i'm gonna try it again Still really couldn't get into the whole time manipulation and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, but I was so intrigued to the story. I really liked the story to the game. Okay. I think, I think at, for a Zelda game, it is a very clean story that strays from what we normally know about Zelda. And I think what I liked about the game and what intrigued me the most was the story. And it's like, can I get past 
the gameplay stuff to enjoy this story. Once again, still couldn't really get into it, so I started watching more and more videos about it until I was forced to play it here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about you, Tom? Yes, uh, got this release day back in 2000. I, I was very excited for this. I got the gold cartridge with the, the holographic. You know, I just want to say, I, I, I don't know the answer. I'm sure someone on the podcast right now listening will yell at me. I don't think a gray version of this cartridge was ever actually produced. Maybe I'm wrong. I've just never seen one. Like they marketed it as like, you know, if you get it on release, you'll you'll get the limited edition gold cartridge. But I've never not seen a gold Majora's Mask cartridge. But I got it day one. I uh, really liked it. I put a lot of time into this growing up, but I did move on from it for a few years. And then uh, I've come back to it a lot because it's a game that I find a, a lot of replay value from just because of the fact that it's, you know, famous time system allows you to replay some of the best elements of this however many times you want. Great admirer of this game in terms of the 3D Zeldas. I put this on the upper tier of them. And you're, no, you're not alone in your opinion of saying this game was kind of confusing. This does have a reputation of being one of the harder Zelda games, one of the more obtuse Zelda games. And we're, we'll get into that in talking about its legacy. But that is my experience with it. And I see you were kind of Googling something. Did you find if there were any gray cartridges? I did, yes. So the gray cartridge is a not-for-resale uh, cartridge version of it. Uh, that's the only way that it was available in gray. It was for a, not for resale. So it must have came in some sort of a bundle or or whatnot. But the gray cartridges, from what I'm seeing in asking prices, track sales, they're going for around $1,200 to $2,000. Holy so shit. It ha- so it has to be some sort of a heavy, heavy thing. 2016, it was going for around $700. So, with, you know, inflation over the past six years, I can see it jumping up. Uh, how funny but, that the gold cartridges are just not special it's the, it's the gray ones yeah but the gold cartridge there was two different versions of the gold cartridge okay i believe there was the regular labeled version and then there was one with like a holographic like a 3d uh yes. type thing which i think came with like a, a special uh, not the special edition but the special kind of day one of, yeah the day, day one basically because that's what i had and that's the cartridge i still had at the time so okay, okay. you either gold hollow or just gold So let's mm, let's go yeah. back in time. Let's go back to the year 2000. We were all, you know, we were like, oh, shit, we survived Y2K. I didn't have plans after this. What are we Nothing worse to do? could happen. Nope. Nope. Post Ocarina of Time. You know, you release something that has just an insane amount of critical acclaim. How do you top it? These were Nintendo's two sequel ideas, Josh. There was the project known as Uru Zelda which Miyamoto heavily pushed for. He wanted a Ocarina of Time remix with redesigned dungeons. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, it sounds like the Master Quest. Yes, that is what it became, the Master Quest. And it was also supposed to be on the 64DD, the disk drive expansion Mm -hmm. that they were going to release. It was going to have a lot of improved gameplay features and new ideas, but that one didn't go forward. What did go forward was a project called Zelda Gaiden, translated as Zelda Side Story. And that's what Majora eventually became. Development started in 1999. Can you imagine, Josh? I guess you can't imagine, because crunch time exists in the industry right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. They, they made this game in a year. And Josh, can you talk about some of, the, some of the ways that they did that? There's a pretty obvious one. Yeah, I mean, you talking about reusing aspects, right? You know, every Zelda game has its special, I don't know, like its niche, its 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 gimmick. Sure. Um, and you're pretty much using the Ocarina once again. Right? The Ocarina to to manipulate time, to to help out and whatnot. But yeah, I mean it's focusing on certain areas of the game, reusing a lot of the aspects, even reusing characters, uh, and whatnot, like it's it's so weird because, like we said, it's a side story, but in the timeline of Zelda, which we're going to dive in a little bit later, um, the timeline to this picks up for the child version. So the the meaty portion of Ocarina of Time, they're pretty much taking a lot of stuff from that and kind of popping it over here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's 
it's based it's based around a lot of the aspects of of Ocarina of Time. The only major difference is the mask. Reusing assets, as you said. Let's talk about this real quick. On our Facebook page during the March Madness campaign, we had one of our fans when when Majora's Mask beat Castlevania Symphony of the Night early in the tournament. We had a fan who was, you know, upset and they said something along the lines of I would rather see Symphony of the Night than a cut and paste Zelda game. And I all of our fans are entitled to their opinions, but I was a little kind of like, hmm, because I think that ignores the fact that, well, yes, it takes characters, it takes textures. It's not like we're back in Hyrule doing the same thing. We are in a newly developed area with new characters and a lot of new mechanics. And I want to talk about games, in your opinion, like, when are you okay or not okay with games reusing stuff? You know, like, do you think any part of Majora's Mask is honestly lazy? You be, like, in your in your 100% opinion? No. No, okay. not absolutely not. Listen, I'm a huge fan of the Souls games, right? Okay. Dark Souls, B- Bloodborne, Elden Ring, all of those. And a lot of aspects are reused in those things. You know, the fighting mechanics to some of the, the weaponry. There's certain characters that appear in all of those games as well. I think... <sighs> Depending on how you do it, right? Like, for instance, Bioshock Infinite reuses a complete area from another Bioshock game, right? To great effect. To great effect, yeah. Right, exactly. Like, I think if it's done in a way to help the story, I think that's fantastic. If it's done in a way to let's just get this out to get this out, that's that's lazy. Because, you know, you can go ahead and you know, constantly keep pumping the same movie out over and over and over again. And it's just not, it, there's, there's no heart there. There's no soul. There's no feeling. There's no nothing. Right. Sure. It's we've just... all seen police Academy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean like when I, when I was thinking about that, like I, I, I know this is going to sound weird, but I'm thinking of like the twilight movies. Right. Like, I don't know why I jumped to that one, but like those movies came out so fast. Right. And it was all like if you put them all up next to each other, it all looks like the same movie, right? Right. We we you know we look at you know the Harry Potter movies and stuff like that. They're reusing a lot of aspects. Now, granted, it's a movie and stuff like that. That's that's different, but like There's, there are visual like, let, evolutions in the Harry Potter franchise. But we talk about like, oh, what's this? It's Voldemort. He's coming back. Oh, what's this? It's Voldemort. He, like it's just a reuse of that same story. Okay. Just with different things surrounding. Right. Sure. Like, and that's what we were getting with the majority of Zelda games. I mean, honestly, every single Zelda game minus maybe four or five, right, have the same story, the same cut and paste story. So if we're going to say, oh, well, this is a cut and paste of Ocarina of Time. No. Twilight Princess is a cut and paste of Ocarina of Time. <laughs> Zelda one. Oh, Ocarina of Time is a copy and paste of Zelda one. Right, it, it, it's the same game, right? Ganon comes back. Okay. You have to collect all the pieces to the Triforce to defeat Ganon. That's all copy and paste to me. Okay, no, right? I, I, that's an interesting. Yeah, I, I'm. But it's what's surrounding that story. Yeah, it's the Venn diagram. You know what I mean? Like you got your new stuff, you got your old stuff, and then you got the mixture in the middle. Look, I'm honestly wishing that we could get a lot more same generation sequels from smartly reusing assets, because I feel like it's becoming rarer and rarer where it's like a a big game comes out and then it takes like nine years for the sequel to come out because they're like, well, we got to push it towards next generation consoles. N64 got two great Zelda games in one console generation. You know, we have breath of the wild two coming up and you know, it, it looks like it is taking the great base of Breath of the Wild 1, and it's like, well, we, we have a game that's not broken. How do we just expand upon it? The upcoming God of War Ragnarok. We we joked, we joked a- eons ago in our old Sunday show about how, like, oh, what's the point of it coming to PS5 if it's also on PS4? But from what I've seen of Ragnarok, it looks like it's the same gameplay engine. It's just expanded and, and, you know, like, polished up. And until we get a new feature-length documentary about God of War 2, you know, it's probably the same character models, just redesigned and polished up. And 
probably the most famous example, look at the PlayStation 2 Grand Theft Auto trilogy. You know, like those games came out super quick and all they really did was just, you know, change the setting, change like change the color and themes of the UI to make it the 80s or the 90s, but it's all the same engines. I would love to see more companies take this approach because then I think we could probably get more quality games or get to live in worlds that we like, you know, more often than, I mean, just for me, you know, I don't have to wait not a, t a decade between Red Dead sequels. You know, if you've got a good Red Dead story, take the engine that already works and just build on it, you know, like, yeah. That's that's my take on it. I, I think Majora's Mask could be a kind of a, an inspiration point for a lot of developers, but, I you know, that's not how the industry works right now. Uh, yeah, listen, we're just two middle aged white guys on the Internet talking about video <laughs> games. What 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 pool do we have? Exactly. No one <laughs> listens to us. No, actually, please listen to us. Well, and you can I, also like, like, the, like, and subscribe and comment and all of our stuff. Oh, yeah, us specifically, yes, yes, yeah. please, please <laughs> us, but development of Majora's Mask. So we were talking about Eiji Anuma, Yoshiaki Koizumi, Nintendo Hall of Famers. Koizumi, do you remember the last game of his we talked about on the show, Josh? No. <laughs> we talked about it uh, last summer. It was a pretty bright and warm game. Oh, 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 Mario Sunshine? Mm-hmm. And Anuma, I mean, of course, obviously, he's basically the, what, the Spielberg of the Zelda series at this point? He just... Yeah, he's like the stepdad. You got uh, Miyamoto, and then it's like he's right next to him. There's the biological father. There's the stepdad, too. He's good. He's, he's yeah, he's, he's doing good. Right, they balance out their time with Link. You know, Link understands what his mom needs and mm -hmm. you know they're both cool they both take them to baseball games but separately mm -hmm. you know never yeah. together yeah. it'd be weird nope. yeah, yeah that'd, that'd be too weird too weird so do you know how they kind of split their duties on majora's mask one worked on like the game schedule like yes. the the three day the three day part and then the other one was focused more on the design elements and stuff like that like so like your dungeons your other towns and stuff like that. Not, not the, not the clock town itself. Exactly. So you are correct. I, uh, we found this from a translated Nintendo dreams interview in 2015. Yoshiaki Koizumi designed the schedule system and he was primarily focused with clock town, its residents and kind of the, the schedules that make up the side quests in the game. And he also handled a lot of like character design for new characters or reworking old ones. And then Aonuma handled the dungeon design, as Josh said, and kind of the design and functions of Termina Field and the world outside of Clocktown. And, I, you know, I think it's just a good thing that this happened like this, because within a year, this, it, this, this is kind of a miracle of a game that it just all happened in a year. I can't see a AAA game happening this kind of cohesively in a year ever. I, I, I don't know. It, it's... Like, whatever your opinions of the final product are, I'm blown away by what they pulled off. Just yeah. Personally. So, okay, listen. In Ocarina of Time, there were puzzles that were tied to being young Link or being old Link. Mm -hmm. And that was creative and unique, and it was something that we never really saw in gaming up until that point. This leaves you at young Link, but stretches that idea over three days. So three days living in a world with with all of these characters and all of these these side side characters and whatnot, where you get to learn their daily routine. You understand it's like it's Groundhog's Day, but over the course of three days. Mm -hmm. And how do you make everything perfect in three days? That is a great puzzle piece. Like it's a great puzzle mechanic of the game that not only do you like you're doing something on day one but it's going to affect halfway through day two but depending on what you do could affect day three or it could not do anything at all like it's uh -huh. there's so much or like and then we're going to talk about our, our favorite quest but like you could give your item to a particular character and then it could ruin the rest of the game it could ruin the rest of the puzzle the side quests and stuff like that and you're not going to be able to do that so it's like how do you figure out the best combination? And, you know, we talk about references and we talk about, you know, what does this game inspire and whatnot. 
And like that is a very from software and Dark Souls related thing. Like, okay. hey, I got I'm going to do this side quest, but I have to give this person that item, but that's going to ruin me from getting this master weapon or this legendary weapon or this legendary spell because I would need to use it here instead. And it's like, how like how do you manage everything over the course of three days? And I think Zelda, uh, Majora's Mask has done it to a way that is so smart and so creative that a lot of people weren't going to take copy and do their own thing with but i don't know if anyone has done it to the scale that zelda did right you do it in the course of one game but this is doing it over the course of three days in a game do you think this cemented aonuma and koizumi within nintendo's like hierarchy like do you think this was kind of like their blank check like okay we we like you guys are 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 company men for the rest of your lives (laughs) You know? Um, I don't, I don't know because like we'd have to talk about how this game was received. Okay, we will get di- to that. To dive into that, sure. So you mentioned the three day system. We've mentioned it a lot. Uh, essentially, what they said you know is this game has a three day system. This game has a three day system. Yes. Wow, play time, <laughs> play time. It, it amounts to an hour. If you play for an hour, the three day clock will run out, and then you have to play the Ocarina of Time to go back, or you attempt to beat the game. The reason, a big reason, they decided on this besides just the creative impulses they had is it allowed them to save on cartridge space. You know what I mean? Like they were like, let's just design a set amount of stuff and then make you have to reset to experience it all. And this, you know, enabled uh, sharper textures, better draw distances on the technical side. This decision helped make it a prettier game overall. And what even helped with the prettiness, if you want to call it, is the expansion pack. <sighs> this was one of the games that required an expansion pack. Josh, could you summarize what an expansion pack is? So the expansion pack was pretty much adding more RAM to your N64, allowing you to run heavier games, I guess heavier produced games or more graphically intense games. Big boys, in, big yeah, games. Big, big games uh, that wouldn't wear or hinder your gameplay experience. You know, you had games like Perfect Dark, Star Fox. No, Star Fox had the Rumble Pack. Uh, I did not have the expansion. Rogue Squadron used it. And I think one of the rare games, uh, besides Perfect Dark. You're um, right. It's a big one. Conquer? No, but I will tell you, Donkey Kong 64, which to my knowledge was not only the game that introduced it because the expansion pack was bundled in, but it's a it's one of three games that needed it or the game wouldn't play at all. So Donkey Kong 64, which needed the expansion pack to correct a game breaking bug. Perfect Dark, which if you didn't have it, all you could play was multiplayer. And then this, they all required the expansion pack or they would not run. So I, back in the day, I had to separately buy an expansion pack with this. Can you think of any other times that something like this had had happened? I got two. The PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, one actually, no. Uh, PlayStation is included with one of them. Ape Escape. Oh, interesting. You can you cannot play that game without a PlayStation analog controller. So the DualShock yes. one, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then the other one is Nintendo with Wii Motion Plus. Oh, you're right. Right? You couldn't really play Skyward Sword without it. You couldn't play Wii Sports Resort without it because it came mm-hmm. bundled with it mm-hmm. but yeah it's you know how do you feel about having to get particular things in order to enjoy games because like like you said you couldn't play perfect dark you couldn't play donkey kong 64 you really couldn't play this without this expansion pack so do you buy the expansion pack separately or do you buy donkey kong 64 so you can get it included listen i understand that it's easier to say this in hindsight because technology is always evolving. But if you are going to force a hardware change on me, the consumer, you better bundle it. That's Mm -hmm. my 100% opinion. I think Donkey Kong 64 was right to include it. But honestly, I think every required game should have had it, uh, you know, because that creates confusion for more casual audiences. And that's not They should have had two SKUs for it. Yeah, they should have had one with the, the expansion and one without the expansion. 
Because yeah. if you already had it, why would you want to have two? You're not going to exactly. have a second N64 unless you're me. <laughs> Josh, if you had it your way, you wouldn't even have one N64. That's true. That's true. The N64 wouldn't have come out. But we cannot get out of talking about this game's background without talking about its tone. This is a dark game, Josh. Uh, yeah, I would say it's pretty dark. Pretty dark? Is it perfect dark? No, it's not perfect dark. It's mm. nitty gritty dark. <laughs> oh, boy. This is... We get down there. It's, it's okay. It's depressing. Do you remember how Indiana Jones Temple of Doom was really dark and sad compared to the first one? Yeah, but and... it was more like cartoony and character. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it was more slapsticky. Sure. I 100% we agree. We need to relate to the kids. Let's rip this guy's heart out. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't learn this obviously until years later, but essentially that movie was as dark as it was because Lucas and Spielberg were going through some shit in their lives. Lucas was coming off a divorce. He's point blank said in an interview, he was like, oh, I, I just wanted to make uh, this Indiana Jones a little darker. You know, so this game, I found out probably one, one of the just the most depressing uh, anecdotes about it. More depressing than the game itself? Well, I mean, not more, are but you, you know. Or are you saying life imitates art? exactly so <laughs> i kind of assumed maybe the crunch was a big reason why this game was sad and it would make sense so from that in that same nintendo dreams interview i brought up they talked about how they attended a wedding in like 1999 2000 and that was at a point in japan's history where north korea was threatening them with nuclear missiles like it seemed like they might do it and I don't remember if it was Anuma or Koizumi in the interview, but they talked about they were like at the wedding and they were like, isn't that kind of crazy that we're here on such a happy day and we could all die at any second from missiles? It's just kind of a weird feeling. And that apparently inspired the Anju and Cafe side quest in this game, you know, fixed, reuniting a married couple against the apocalypse. And, you know, if that is just the tone and the mood they were in for one side quest. I can't imagine what else was going on in their lives <laughs> through the rest of this game. Would you rather be crushed by a moon at a wedding or blown up by a missile at a wedding? I would probably say, I, I, weirdly, I would say the moon. Interesting. Because I would look and go, huh, well, I never thought I'd see that. I mean, <laughs> missile strikes, you could probably see, you know what I mean? Like, it's, we're almost in World War Three right now. Like, uh. <laughs> But but the moon coming into Earth, uh, that's <laughs> that's more impressive. <laughs> you always make the most depressing predictions on the podcast. You first you're like <laughs> first you're like God of War is gonna get delayed. Now you're like World War Three is gonna happen. Are they together? Well, hmm. I don't know. Neither one have happened yet. When God of War Three gets delayed, that's when someone just is pushed. There you too go. Far. That, that's that's World War Three starting. <laughs> Your opinion of the overall dark tone of this game, Josh? I really liked it. Okay. I I think at one point in time, like it's one of those games you should not play it straight through. Okay. I think you should play it for a little bit, take a break, play it for a little bit, take it because it's it's very depressing. It is very dark. It is very uneasy at at times. I think staying in that world for a really long period of time might psychologically do something to you because it's it's not a happy game. Like there's mm -hmm. some happy conclusions, but it's really not a happy. I agree with you. There are kind of moments of uplift and and hope amongst the darkness, but it makes you live in that darkness to get to that hope. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, going back. The to night is always dark before the dawn. So let's get into the story of this game. Josh, can you kind of give me like the the, the movie summary that you'd find on TV Guide? for what, this, <laughs> what, what the story of this game is. Join Link as he's on a quest to find Skull Kid. Skull Kid has uncovered the mask, not Jim Carrey's mask, and it is going to take over and possess him. Somebody stop him, and Link is here to save the day. Five stars. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to play the game. <laughs> yeah, so Skull Kid, minor character in Ocarina, becomes a major player here, finds an evil mask, and what's the first thing he does to Link upon meeting him, Josh? He's like, hey, boop. You get turned into a Deku seed. <laughs> yep, Link's turned into, you know, what we at the time kind of, maybe if you considered some of the more pathetic baddies in the series, but now oh Link's one of them. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. Oh, I mean, this game almost did the Metal Gear Solid 2 and killed off Link right at the beginning of the game. This is Deku Den. 
with long blonde <laughs> hair. <laughs> Link becomes a Deku scrub. He becomes companions with a new fairy, Tattle, uh, sister of Tail. Tattle, Tail, get it? And, oh! And he sets out to get the evil mask back from Skull Kid at the behest of the happy mask salesman. Oh, again, Akria time character. Got a got a uh, a promotion, a pay boost to be a major character, and he enters the world of Termina and its central city of Clock Town. So, what do you think of Clock Town as a location, Josh? I liked it as a little bit of a hub. Yeah, I liked mm-hmm. it. I liked that the world felt more alive. You know, it was something that I talked about. I think when we did the Ocarina of Time one, like I love the market. I love the square because like it felt like it was lived in. Right? It felt like there was a history here it felt like something was happening and that's exactly what this reminded me of like people are just going about their day normally and you get to see what this town looks like over the course of three days clock towns divided into multiple sectors north south east west with some interesting little hub areas or side areas i guess is a better word you can meet all the characters you can get an item called the Bomber's Notebook through your progression through the story, which is basically a side quest Bible. And once you have it, every character you meet who has side quests attached, they get logged. And that's like what you're saying, a big part of like, like, you know, meeting everybody, learning their personalities through the quests that you help them with. There's some compelling stuff in here. I I really like it. Dare I say... Now, the Skull Kid storyline is really compelling what it gets into about, you know, is the Skull Kid evil because he's a dick or is he evil because, you know, he's he's a lonely person. Yeah. Is he corrupted or is he lonely? But I love so many of the side stories in this game and what they bring up about the characters. You know, you have characters who are so obsessed with their jobs that they don't know how to live a life beyond it. Or you have characters who, you know, they just want to perfect the best dance they can for the circus troupe they're in, like the Dancing Sisters. You know, it's like, oh, we just want to do a really good job. You know, it, there's so many interesting people. So what what, what would you what would you say about that? Did you, like, in terms of main story versus side quest, favorite, least favorite, tell me what you think. I think the side quests really shine more than the main story. And I think hmm. that's, honestly, when people talk about this game, they talk about the side quests more than they talk about the main story. Is that similar to another game? Yes. What is it? Witcher 3. People talk about oh. the side quests in The Witcher 3. You know, how long, what, it takes like two to four hours or something like that to be able to actually get a lady's frying pan like in The Witcher <laughs> because there's so much that goes into it, right? Or trying to figure out this demonic baby, uh, this creature and stuff like that, and where it came from and who put it there and all this kind of stuff like those are the things that people talk about in The Witcher 3. Okay. They don't talk about the main story. <laughs> like, and we talk about all the side quests. We talk about, you know, when you say about Majora's Mask, people say, oh, yeah, the time traveling, the, like, the three-day cycle. And then right after that, people say the Bomber's Notebook, right? They don't talk about Skull Kid. They don't talk about the mask possession and all that kind of stuff. I think those are, those are popular. I wouldn't bury him completely. But no, but. no. But like when you look at the order of things that people talk about. Okay. Okay. Sure. I think that the the notebook stands a little bit of a higher pedestal than the, the main story. I think that adds to the replayability of this game. Because not only do you have side quests, which reset every time you go back to the first day, some of these side quests have branching outcomes. And you mentioned that way back when we were talking about, you know, if you give a character the wrong item on the wrong day, it completely changes the outcome of things. The Anju Cafe storyline, which is probably the most involved side quest. Anju, the innkeeper, has not seen her fiancé in a while. She doesn't know what happened to him. And over the course of the three days, you find out what happened to the fiancé, and you go on this quest to reunite them. And if you do everything right, you can. But if you miss an order or, you know, in your detectiving, you don't find the right clues, uh, you can mess up and you can come and find all the participants on the final day being basically like, well, this is it. I'm about to be crushed by the moon. I'm going to die. And I am not with the one I love. And that's where, you know, you talk about the depressing stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like they really make it stark. Uh, What about you? What would you say is like a favorite side quest for you? 
Uh, <laughs> I like the toilet paper guy. <laughs> paper, please. Yeah. P -p 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 paper, please. Um, <laughs> Tell people what that is, Josh. Uh, it's just this like weird, like there's a hole in the floor. In the, I think it's in the inn. Um, and there's just a giant arm that sticks out of it. And he's just, like trying to find toilet paper so he can wipe his butt. Uh, <laughs> and then if you, you could give him paper, any paper. But if you give him the wrong one, that could affect another storyline, right? Like, mm -hmm. but I know I love it because it's just so stupid and so dumb. Yeah, but I mean, of course, yeah, the innkeeper. That's I think that's the one that kind of stands out the most for a lot of people. I do like the mailman quest also. Right? Yeah. He basically, he 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 loves being the mailman, but he also wants to leave town because he knows the moon's gonna fall. But he's like, but I have to deliver the mail every day. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Like I like that there was like the con like the like the confliction in him like i, I want to do what i love doing but i also don't want to die <laughs> so outside of clock town we've got areas that lead to the dungeons and the other storylines of the game i feel like and i'm sorry about the interrupting yeah. here but i do feel like once again we talk about the list of things that people talk about this game, nobody really mentions the dungeons. Nobody mentions the temples. Nobody mentions all of that kind of stuff. They usually just mainly focus on the side quest and then the main story of this game. I feel like it is like your fourth or fifth talked about thing in this game. Like, it, like your dungeons, which are regarded as one of the best parts of the Zelda games, like with their puzzle mechanics and stuff like that, is so far below on the list. But people talk about how great this game is. Like, are they I'll talking about how great it is based off of the story? Or are they talking about how great it is based off of the gameplay? Because, mm. like, at one point in time now, does the story outshine the gameplay? I'll tell you why I think that. I think it's because two of these dungeons are some of the hardest dungeons in Zelda ever. And in terms of 3D or 2D, and I will even say that in 100% seriousness, those being Snowhead Temple and the Water Temple. And then the final dungeon is one of the more obnoxious temples in the game. And I'll get to I'll get to why. But yeah, I think the difficulty and some of the quality of life things in the game as they were upon release kind of makes people don't want to talk about. Them. What I will say I do like about them is they all have very distinct themes. You know, Southern Swamp, it's a poison swamp. It's very lush, very tropical. You ha you go to Great Bay. The Zora community feels a lot more lived in than Zora's domain did in Ocarina of Time. You know, the main Zora is you're trying to help our Zora rock band. I think that's pretty yeah. badass. And then you go to Icona Canyon for, for Stone Tower Temple. It's all spooky and haunted. And you know what I mean? They all have their own personalities, which I really, truly love. And it's at each of these locations that you will get a mask, which, you know, going back to the mask based gameplay you can become one of the races of Termina. You can become a Deku, a Goron, or a Zora. Putting those masks on also gives you the abilities of said race. Josh, what is your favorite mask and mechanic? Okay, so my favorite mask is none of these. My favorite mask is the bunny hood. Gotta go fast. And like, I mean, for mechanic wise, I think the, I think the bunny hood is the best. And then uh, Kamaro's mask. I love Kamaro's mask because it's so creepy and disgusting. And oh, you just get to dance, man. You just get to, you know, you just get to loosen up. And you, yeah, you just, woo. Like, but I like it because it's yeah. practically just his face. Like, Stick it's it like, out of yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, like, I like that one. Okay, Those nice. Those are my two. Nice. What about you? Out of the transformation ones, though, what one did you like the most? I actually, I think out of all of them, then it would be the Zoro. It looks cool. Yeah. It's melee attack is badass and Zora swimming. I, yeah. Hot take. Best swimming in all of gaming. Mm, it's, I mean, it's up there. Honestly, I would say the swimming in Sekiro is probably one of the best I've ever experienced. Hmm. Um, but I, cause like, I would not say the Deku. I think you spend too much time in the Deku. Well, it's the first one you're in, and depending right. on how quickly you get out, sure, sure, I get you. Because it's very similar to like what I was saying in the Ocarina of Time. You spend so much time as young Link that it gets to be annoying. Like, and I think that one you spent in this, you spend so much time as Deku Link that it gets to be annoying. I like the 
bomb mask because early in the game it's kind of a neat way to cheese not having a bomb bag or anything and just stick your face and blow up walls and stuff like that despite having played this game a ton i actually haven't thought about most of the common masks before the transformation right. masks to be honest because right. you don't need those those con like the the regular common ones you know what i mean the side quest ones you don't really need them they have their individual uses at times Correct. but right. right yeah i mentioned difficulty in terms of dungeons snowhead temple the goron dungeon that is centered around this like pillar of removable snow plates and you're basically like kind of spiraling around going up and down this pillar and you got to knock plates out on certain floors to get the central column to collapse enough to reveal rooms that is probably one of if not the most like kind of frustrating dungeon in this game because it takes a lot of time and careful evaluation i am highly positive that you can mess it up if you punch out like the wrong sections and cause the column to collapse too much, you basically have to reset the day and go back and then come back to the temple and try again. Did you get like in your initial childhood playthrough? Did you ever get that? No, I never got that far. No. Okay. Not, not until this. Okay. Yeah. How did you feel about it today? Like in this day? Um, age? I mean, I had a play with a little bit of a guide when it came to it. Cause just because I was getting frustrated, okay. but I think, I don't think it was as difficult because playing on the 3DS, your bottom screen was your map. Oh, I didn't know your. Oh, we're going to have a talk at the end. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. No, but playing on the 3DS, uh, your bottom screen was a map. So you kind of knew where you were at. You kind of knew where you needed to go, what you need to do and stuff like that. But using a guide kind of helped me a little bit, you know. Yeah, no judgment. Because I, I, I never wanted to get frustrated. You're right. Because then if I got frustrated, I knew I was just going to sit it down and not come back to it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have, I had a player's guide for Ocarina of Time. I don't think I had one for Majora. And hey, player's guides, even though they kind of don't exist anymore, and now people just kind of watch YouTube walkthroughs, there's nothing wrong with them. Oh, no. If no. you need help, go for it. We're, you know, get good mentality can be kind of toxic. We're not about that here. Oh, well, except for souls. <laughs> Josh, Josh will just tell me to get good at souls. But other, anyway. <laughs> But the Great Bay Temple is the second one because that involves a series of basically pipes and plumbing systems in this temple that redirect the current of the way the water flows. And again, it's a lot of memorization and like, OK, if this current goes here, da 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 da, you know, you got to be really specific to get where you want to, to go. And if you mess up, you don't have to reset the clock for this one, but you do have to go all out of your way to, to repeat things and fix things. Frustrating. It was annoying because like when I when I go into these, yeah, I said I use the guide. Right. But it's sure. like it's not till after I try to do it myself. I want to see how smart am I? Turns out I'm usually not that smart. No, oh. but <laughs> when it comes to these, I think that's where I got frustrated the most was the water system. And then Stone Temple, as we mentioned, it's the final temple out in the desert. What I have what I personally feel and what I've seen people complain about is that that requires playing one of the final songs you get, the Elegy of Emptiness, which creates statues of Link in his different forms that you can leave on switches. And that dungeon is really switch heavy, you know, like open this door, play the song to leap a statue on a switch, flip the temple, play this song, you know, and you have to manually play the song and transform manually between the masks so many times that it's a point of frustration for people because it gets really tedious and just but i think bad. atmospherically i think it's the best sure it's i love the the music from it i love the kind of inverted the you know mm -hmm. like it's got a really personality like atmosphere personality all of these are heavy on it would you say that these dungeons are better worse or on par with ocarina's well, if I'm just doing a one-to-one, -one, because there's only four dungeons in this game mm -hmm. compared to the eight in Ocarina, so the, it's cut in half. If we go Southern Swamp to Forest Temple, I think Forest Ocar is still... Ocarina wins. Yeah. If we do Snowhead Temple to Fire Temple in Ocarina, I guess Ocarina, not just because you don't have the center column bullshit, but like I personally like like freeing all the Gorons from jail, and they're like, "Hey, you're my friend." Hey. Like yeah, I, I, I yeah. like the creativity though to the pillar. Okay, I like the creativity of Great Bay's current system, 
like it's basically like this weird water power plant that just kind of inexplicably exists for the Zoras. Mm -hmm. Whereas the water temple, I think Great Bay's water temple is actually harder than Ocarina's water temple. Does one feel more rewarding for you? Great Bay's feels more rewarding in that I, I'm, I'm proud of myself when I actually get it right. <laughs> and then finally, I guess Stone Temple would be compared against the Spirit Temple. I like Spirit Temple way more because you do it in two timelines as young and adult Link. So three out of the four, I prefer Majora. Okay. I'm like uh, a dentist. Three out of four dentists prefer Majora to Ocarina. <laughs> <laughs> and you also have, you know, the moon, but that's not really. Yeah, it's a weird kind of mini dungeon in its own. Yeah. Right? But yeah, you get to that at the end of the game after you've completed the dungeons and freed the giants that dwell within them. You can go back to Clock Town, summon the giants, they hold up the moon, and then Skull Kid retreats into the moon. And you go there and it's this really trippy dreamscape where you may be in Skull Kid's head, you may be in Major the, the head of Majora itself. What do you think where do you think you are, Josh? I I like to think that you are in Skull Kid's head. Because okay. you're going into kind of his brain to figure out, like, the possession of the mask, right? Like, you're going in deeper to Skull Kid's brain to find out what's causing all of this, and then you're trying to eliminate it. Right. Because the way you trigger the final boss is you confront a lonely kid in the Majora mask. Like there's, there's, there's a bunch of kids wearing the masks of the bosses of each temple, and they're all playing together, but... The kid wearing the Majora mask is alone. And we talked about loneliness. Like, what is forcing Skull Kid to be evil? Kind of because he feels like people don't like him. You have a final boss battle with kind of the spirit of the mask itself. And once you defeat it, the moon blows up, which I assume creates Has massive... No yeah, no repercussions at all to the world. No flooding. The, the, the tides yeah. aren't going to do anything. No, the dolphins are fine. Exactly. Great Bay it is not ruined right away. The happy mask salesman gets the now purified mask back and you're free to leave. It's like, OK, thanks. Get out of here. And Link continues his quest to find Navi. And that's the end of the story there. Art design wise, how do you feel about the game? Art design wise, I mean, it's, it's Ocarina of Time's art. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I mean, like I said that the 3DS version, much cleaner, much po more polished. Um, okay. Very similar to like we talked about when it came to Ocarina of Time, but I think I prefer this art style a little bit more over Ocarina. And I don't know if it's because I prefer the darkness or the grittiness of this, because I mean, we talked about Ocarina of Time, you know, and I said, you shouldn't play Ocarina of Time. You should more focus on Twilight Princess. And that might be because of the tonality you like your zelda games darker yeah i i mean i really do and that's why i think breath of the wild 2 is going to be much better than breath of the wild 1 because it's going to be a much darker tone to what we got in breath of the wild okay where okay. breath of the wild was more curiosity you know what i mean it's it's fresh it's like you're you're a newborn baby waking up and rubbing your eyes and walking out <laughs> to your temple and everyone going oh a sheikah slate i haven't seen one of those in a hundred years but now everybody knows you, and they're just like, yeah. oh, it's Link. What do you uh, want? What do you want? <laughs> yeah, you got Sheikah Slate. Great, whatever. I don't care. I think this is a gorgeous game. A lot of things obviously look better than Ocarina of Time. You know, Termina Field feels more active with stuff to do than Hyrule Field. Yeah. It also just looks better. Like, the grass looks more lush, even though it's still kind of, you know, N64 polygonal. The towns look better. And as you said, more lived in. You know, there's, like, cracked sidewalks and dirty walls and kind of posters hanging everywhere. It, it's it's a nice, smart upgrade where they clearly were thoughtful about how can we just make this look better. And final opinion I need from you, soundtrack of this game. What's your take on the soundtrack? I love it. I love how trippy and industrialized it is compared to how chipper and how joyous Ocarina of Time came off. I, I really do like that this was just like, let's just throw a whole bunch of <laughs> instruments at the wall and figure out what type of sound it makes. Uh, and sure. we're, you know what? We're going to do it. I mean, that's what we're just hit record. Do that. Great. That's the dungeon sound. All right. <laughs> like next now, absolutely. The use of synthesizers and just these moody, dark piano chords really push this game in terms of we're talking about its depressing tone, but it's like interesting tone. Um, I don't know how big of a David Lynch fan you are, but 
but for listeners, if you haven't seen the show Twin Peaks, uh, a lot of familiar kind of influences in the soundtrack of this from there. I could never definitively find anything that said if Eiji Anuma or anybody, you know, specifically pulled from Twin Peaks, but, you know, a dark and depressing game that's really moody and atmospheric, like, that's something that seems right up Lynch's alley. But beyond that, like, how each of the transformations have their own unique musical instrument, like, the Deku Scrub has weird kind of bagpipes, the Zora's got this badass guitar, the Goron's got his little bongos, and there's even a side quest based around, like, each of your forms playing your instruments at a concert and all coming together. Like, music is used really well here. There's there's two ways that we can go here. We can talk about the reception, or we can talk about what else has spawned from this game. Where would you like to go? I think reception is kind of a little easier. Uh, look, this game was met with critical acclaim at the time, and as you mentioned, it's only gotten stronger. At the time, people were like, it's not better than Ocarina, but it's impressive all the same. You know, a lot of 9s, 10s, a pluses. The Tampa Bay Times gave it an A plus. Josh, can you believe it? Uh, you Tampa... know what? When I think about all my video game reviews and stuff like that, I always go to the Tampa Bay Times. Exactly. Exactly. TBT, so as we like to call it. TBT. But let's yeah, let's get into influences because I think it's it's important. I think this game did give us a lot of cool stuff. Twilight Princess tonality. You had the break with Wind Waker, but. They, I feel like it's, I would say like every other Zelda game now has become like, you have your bright one and then you have your dark one, right? Like, I feel like Breath, like, I feel like Breath of the Wild kind of breaks that a little bit, but it is darker in a lot of aspects than Skyward Sword. Right. So, yeah. But the next one. Going to be darker. It's yeah. going to be darker, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think, you know, this game being as creepy as it was definitely influenced Twilight. Uh, and I think. Princess. It, Twilight Princess. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Right. Big, big <laughs> distinction, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I think this game and the way people were attached to it probably caused the rejection of Wind Waker. Wind Waker is not a bad game. It was not a bad game when it came out. It's not a bad game now. But people were like, no, you got to you got to take them one at a time. I think like, like you were saying, like, you know, they can't all be dark. No, Zelda. There's a lot of, you know, bright, happy, kind of hopeful things vibes that each of the Zelda games bring to the table. If they were all just dark and depressing, I think Zelda wouldn't be Zelda. Yeah. Personally. For me. Right. No, but that's the thing though, right? Like Zelda one chipper, you know, happy, all whatnot. Zelda two, ridiculously hard, a little bit more darker in its tone. Mm -hmm. Link to the past kind of combined the two because your normal, you know, like the game is much, it has a darker tone to it, but it does have that, open like during the daytime during certain villages that you go to there is a lot of joy in that game too but then there also is a lot of darkness there link's awakening uh, i would say it's pretty pretty chipper coming from that and then oracle of seasons and oracle of ages they are a little bit tonally darker well th that's actually funny you bring that up because just within the two of them I think seasons is chipper and and ages is darker. Right. So like right? yeah, just so it, those, it does yeah. seem like your every other Zelda game is darker. This comes at the tail end of the N sixty four, not like the very final year. The N sixty four would go up to at least two thousand two, but you know it's an interesting example of right as a console is about to retire, we we start seeing the games that really pushed it towards what it could do. Obviously, because developers have had years to figure out all the kind of secrets and tricks of a console. Here's some of the games released in the N64's final years. You got Perfect Dark. You got this. Banjo-Tooie, WWF No Mercy, Dr. Mario 64, Pokemon Stadium 2, Paper Mario, Spider-Man, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and then the final, the final N64 game, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Is this the best run of N64 games, Josh? Yeah, and you know that's me coming, you know, coming from somebody who doesn't really like the N sixty four. I just think it was interesting to note, like a lot of the beloved N sixty four games people talk about. You know, they came out kind of one at a time. Like we had Mario sixty four, bit of a gap. Star Fox sixty four, bit of a gap. Ocarina, this, this boom, is boom, boom, just boom, 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 boom. Yeah, one after the other. 
and it's, it's almost massive. like the launch of the Switch when the Switch came out and there was a big game every month. So you're saying the the final years of the Switch are going to be amazing? Well, no, I I think that they started <laughs> off too strong. Oh, so you're saying this is going to be a reverse in 64? Yes, yes. Oh no. <laughs> The ongoing popularity of it caused the demand for a 3DS remake, and I did not know that you were playing that for this episode. I think that's really interesting. Well, the same way that I played Ocarina. I just didn't think that is what you were going to do. Yep. Now, give me your overall impressions of what you remember the N64 version being like and what the 3DS version was like. The N64 version, I thought it was a little clunky. I thought it controlled very similar to ocarina of time which i wasn't a huge fan of the way that that moved and how it operated but playing it on the 3ds it just felt modern it felt just better is a stupid word to use right there but i think it just felt it felt like it should right it's not the nostalgic glasses saying hey it's going to you know this is what i remember it like no this is how it should feel this is how it should have played See, that's really interesting to me because while I have not played the Majora's Mask remake, the the YouTuber Narrell, who I follow a lot, he does a lot of interesting breakdowns of games. And when he talked about this, he kind of pointed out how some mechanics were changed in a way where they are not as effective as they were on the N64 version, or they're just like different in a way that in some cases kind of ruin how the game's played. He talked a lot about Deku Scrub Link and about how his movements were kind of slowed down and you need a lot more like wind up space to start running across water. Whereas on the N64, he was a little bit more mobile on water and it affects, you know, getting around the Southern swamp to a degree. Right. And that's just one of many other things I've heard. Uh, I've heard that the final boss of the stone temple pilots, uh, no, the, the final boss of the Icona. I, I I keep saying Icona because I keep getting it wrong, but, (laughs) Twin Mold, the two giant worms. I've yeah. heard that they're pain in the ass to beat on the 3DS compared to how the fight plays out on the N64 version. I guess for you, you wouldn't know because you only played it on the 3D, like by your own admission. You right. didn't get to Twin right. Mold on the N64. If you listening know, leave us comments, you know, wherever you can. I'd love to hear a discussion about what you think about the, the differences because it's really interesting to me. And even though I have a copy downstairs, I refuse to go find out. I'm just <laughs> Um, so I know we wanted to talk about the fandom Mm -hmm. and I know you wanted to talk about, you wanted me to talk about the, uh, cartridge, the, the, the cartridge, the possessed cartridge, but I would like (laughs) you to talk about the possessed cartridge if possible, because I want to talk about something else. Oh, all right. So yeah, in, in our research, I, I threw Josh Ben drowned, which if you don't know, it's one of the earliest examples of creepypasta. Josh, do you know what, what creepypasta is? Yeah, creepypasta is pretty much like, I I don't want to say like your first like area, uh, like the first carnation in, in integration of like Reddit, but it was a place that people went and posted up spooky stories, right? Like their own like fan fiction of things that could have happened, things that didn't happen. They, you know, I think Slender Man came from uh, creepypasta. It's, it's basically... Internet urban legend. Yeah. And Ben Drowned is one of the earliest incarnations of it in that in the early 2010s, it kind of organically emerged. But someone named Alexander D. Hall started posting a series of stories and videos on the Internet about how he bought a haunted Majora's Mask cartridge from a yard sale. And as he played it, he started being haunted by the ghost of someone named Ben who had drowned after suffering a series of horrors in their personal life and their soul was in this cartridge. And it was like a big mystery about like, you know, Alexander in the fictional thing was like trying to figure out what happened to Ben going back to the house where the yard sale was. And it continued to evolve over like a decade. I, I actually didn't know it it came this far, but it started in 2010. I probably heard about it in like 2014 ish. And then as recently as 2020, Paul has been like producing more stuff with it but it's classified right now as a multimedia alternate reality game web series and yeah this is one of the earliest creepypastas it kind of pushed it to what we know today like you said slender man being probably the big mainstream one where the slender man narrative kind of led over into some real life violence and stuff like that uh it's just interesting how majora's mask spawned this entire kind of yeah culture 
but what did you have? You wanted to bring something. Oh, have you ever heard of Ember Labs? No, I'm not familiar. Ember Labs is a uh, like a little studio on YouTube. And okay. about five to six years ago, they created a video short called Terrible Fate. Ooh, is this the CGI one? It is the CGI prequel video that they made of how Skull Kid got the Majora Mask. And it is amazing. It is about a four to five minute long video, but it is so well done. You get to see, you know, what Skull Kid looked like before the mask was on, the, you know, the relationship that he had out in the middle of the, the forest and stuff like that, how he came in possession of the mask, what happened to, to getting to the point where we see him in the game and how it turns out, you know, what it is. But yeah, I think it is a fantastic video. Um, it is one of those just great fan-made videos that, you know, people just love this game so much that... They went ahead and like, I want to make my own CG thing. And they could have used it like a lot of people do of like, I'm going to use this to see if anybody would want me to work on a video or a movie or something along the lines of this. But tonality wise, it's the same as the game itself. Like there is just that darkness or just there's a creepiness kind of lingering in the background of everything in the game. And I think. It is an amazing short video that you should definitely give them. Yeah, I mean, there's 11 million views on the video already, but I think you should definitely, you know, make it 11 million and one or two or three <laughs> or four or four. <laughs> now, I agree with you completely in terms of fan made gaming films. It is up there, top tier, and the animation is really incredible. I've got nothing else to add, but please check it out for yourself. Very, very good. Now, before we get to our classic question, Josh. Let's get an important question out of the way. Is this better than Ocarina of Time? Yes. And why do you think that? I think story-wise, it's while it might not be as praised that uh, of what Ocarina was, because Ocarina is a cookie-cutter hero's story, hero's mm. journey. This is kind of a what if scenario i think overall for how fast it took to turn this around um the quality of the story how it, it's a smart story like it's a completely original story compared to what we had originally with ocarina of time i think they took a lot of risk in this game and it paid out more it is i think just a much stronger cohesive story and i think it's great because you know do you want oh i'm gonna say this and i don't want to oh I'll do it do it do you want the force awakens or do you want the last jedi Hmm. do you want something that's cookie cutter and familiar or do you want something that pushes and tries to do new things and go in new directions to that this franchise can evolve. Hmm. I think I want Majora's last Jedi. And, and <laughs> one worked out way better than the other one, right? I think Majora's mask worked out better than Ocarina of time. I think force awaken worked out better than the last Jedi. Mm. <laughs> but uh, I would agree with you that I think this is better than Ocarina. You know, we're, we're using star Wars analogies. You know, this is the empire to Ocarina's new hope. It's like, when I was younger, I look, I like Empire, but when I was younger, it was like, Empire's way better than New Hope. And then I listened to this fair argument that it's like, that's a bullshit argument because you don't have Empire without New Hope. It's like kind of pointless to say which is better. Functionally, sure, Ocarina is still a masterpiece, but I respect that this game does more with less. You know, if we found some way to distill this down to a percentage, arguably this is probably less traversed space, but everything has such depth such better writing personality nothing's wasted it, yeah exactly it, like i use the hyrule field versus termina field example just to say that like there's more to do even in just the overworld but yeah i would rather play this than ocarina uh if a gun was to my head so the eternal question of would you skip play beat or complete i say, say beat Interesting, because you were on the border of skip when we talked about Ocarina. Yeah, but this is this is bumped up to a a beat. Okay. Yeah, I think I think overall, 
if you want a unique experience, if you want to see storytelling to such a complex but more enjoyable and pay off demeanor, I would say yes. Technically, I would say beat this game. Completing, there's some quests that you really don't need to do. There's some that are not, they don't have a great payoff. But in the process, if you see a story that you like, oh, I'm going to go do that one. Yeah, I'd say beat. What about you? I'm a complete guy for this, just in that uh, I think I, I I personally am fine with like n- sure not every side quest is a winner. There are some where it's just like ah oh, all right cool I helped you. But going as deep as you can into this game really brings out the true rewards of the storylines and the items. I can't believe we didn't talk about the fierce deity mask, but yeah, that's the 100% reward. You get turned into uber adult Link with just this one hit kill sword. That's pretty epic. But, but you get yeah. it at the end. True. You right. Don't like that. You that that's well, the thing. Like that was what I hated about Banjo Kazooie. Hey, go ahead and complete all these things to get this particular item that you can't use. And for in, <clears throat> okay, you use it for the end. It's it. It's basically, did you do everything? Here's an easy fu- finale of for, like a boss fight. You know what I mean? It's it's a reward for those who went the extra mile. But here, but this is the thing. You can replay all the bosses in this infinitely. And once you have the Fierce Deity Mask, you keep it forever. So you can go back and use it against Odolwa and the bull and the fish. I forget they're all their names, but Odol- like you can reuse it in, in circumstances. So that's a complete from me. Beat from Josh. And that has been your March Madness 2022 champion. We yeah. hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Because Josh... <laughs> no, no I, I, I enjoyed it more than Ocarina. But until next time, this has been Josh. And I'm Tom. And we will see you in the future, or if you have an ocarina three days in the past. I can go back to before I threw my back out. (laughs) God, we're old. While we boot up the Triflux capacitor, please take some time to subscribe to the show and leave us a review wherever you listen. This show is nothing without you, and any support helps. If you want to connect with us and discuss the past, present, or future of gaming, check out Bad Elephant Gaming on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And don't forget to watch our other videos on YouTube, where we bring you gaming experiences you'll never forget. We also have a Twitch channel where we play games for the show and for fun. Come chat with us anytime at twitch.tv slash badelephantgaming. Thanks for listening. And until next time, we'll see you in the future.